Welcome to this CSPC webinar featuring, featuring two of Canada's most active researchers in science, technology, and innovation policy. Today's session is entitled Innovation, Confederation, and COVID. And believe it or not, we can link all three themes. So my name is Janet Hallowell, and I chair the board of the Canadian Science Policy Council. And it's my pleasure to moderate this discussion with our two distinguished guests, David Castle and Peter Phillips. David Castle is professor in the School of Public Administration and the Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria. His research focuses on science, technology, and innovation policy, with a particular emphasis on regulation standards, regulation, standards, intellectual property, and public consultation associated with life science innovation. Peter Phillips is Distinguished Professor of Public Policy in the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy and Founding Director for the Centre for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. His research focuses on the political economy of innovation with a particular interest on science-driven industrial innovation and related policies and strategies, especially in the bioscience sector. So let's launch right into our discussion. Uh, David and Peter have published widely on various aspects of the innovation system at local and national levels. Uh, and they're now in the final stages of a book focusing on the subnational level, provinces and territories. That level is something that other than a recent CCA study um, has been a sadly neglected level of analysis in Canada. So David, could I ask you to lead off with a few comments on the triggers for this most recent book and some highlights of the insights? Sure, thank you, Janet. Um, it all started, I think, with um, a book that Peter and I uh, published in 2016 with our colleague Bruce Dern, which was about the Canadian innovation system taken as a whole. And we published that and uh, it, was a, it was a good experience to provide some scholarship that sort of rounded, rounded up uh, a number of things that we thought were going on in the innovation scene in, in Canada. And then I think we were uh, thinking about what we might do next and got to talking about the fact that whenever we look at an innovation system study, it tends to be really of one or two types, either, either very local and very micro, uh, looking at local actors uh, in, in small networks in say municipalities, uh, or it tends to be a national system. And we were thinking that there's a giant gap between those, a gap that exists in the literature around innovation system, probably in all countries, but a very interesting gap in the case of a country like Canada, uh, where we have a confederation and we have distributed powers and an extra layer of government than you might see uh, between uh, municipalities and, and, the, and the country as a whole. And what, one of the things that we noticed was that the interesting fact of nationally oriented innovation studies is that they, they tend to give a kind of a coherence to the analysis because the nation state is uh, an anchoring uh, theme and it gives uh, a sense that there's a, an overarching unity to the analysis looking at what a nation state is doing. And so we wanted to look at whether or not um, that same level of coherence existed at the subnational uh, level. And, you know, the sneak, the sneak preview on that is, no, it doesn't. It's wildly heterogeneous uh, in, in Canada. Uh, and uh, we can talk more about that. Uh, but what we were, we were quite interested in was the, the fact that, um, that the provinces and territories actually control so many of the levers associated with uh, with innovation and science and technology. Um, they, they largely run the, the health systems. They, they run the post-secondary systems. They have direct responsibility over much of environmental regulation and labor and so on and so forth. And indeed, they also create cities and cities are often where we see most of innovation happening. And so with that, we, we found when we looked across the country, uh, the provinces and territories were doing very different things from one another. And they were also not necessarily doing things that were strictly speaking in line with what the federal government was, was doing with their uh, national in oriented innovation policy. Peter, why don't you jump in and, and talk a little bit more about that sort of interplay of the, uh, the, the players. So you've got your federal and province bilaterals, you've got your inter-provincial um, 
initiatives and activities and relationships. Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the diversity of approaches that we see across Canada? In the first instance, there's a, there's a, 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 a gap in the framing of what we think we're doing. When we talk with our federal colleagues, they see a coherent, coherent top-down, purposeful allocation of resources and activities. And so they, they look through le- prisms like the tri-agencies or through the special operating agencies like Genome Canada or through projects like uh, the superclusters. And they say, we have, we have designed a system that is coordinated and managed and, and delivering what the nation state wants. When you look from the bottom up, what you discover is that everything that looks like it's it's uniquely purposed by the federal system is in fact part of a, a much bigger network of activities. And those activities are, are often distributed in ways that the federal system never even understands. Because the the you know, if I think of bioscience in Canada, it doesn't matter if it's biopharma in, in Quebec or the uh, the, uh, the the biotech in, focused on agri-food in Western Canada, that's distributed quite widely. But it looks like it's well organized through agriculture and agri-food programming and through uh, uh, Industry Canada or uh, I said programming, and yet it's not. It's it's reorganized. It's remanaged. It's it's repurposed for the the regional and local interests. And and sometimes the province is is a core part of that re- reframing. Quite often they they are more a, a, an agent of or a partner with others who are motivated. It could be an industrial group, group it could be a community group, but they, they, they find that in many cases, the, the best driver is, is the closest driver to where the action is. And so it, everybody gets pulled around and organized by a, 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 a motivated entrepreneur or entrepreneur or, or, or agency that, that may not be cleanly in any of the domains, federal, provincial, or, or, municipal it or even in the private sector it's one of these uh, uh, change agents bridging organizations and, and so we saw that in the maritimes we saw that in the prairies we saw that in, in ur- large urban centers in Canada it, it seemed to be a, 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 a an enduring reality that that as much as you try and structure and design how innovation will happen because it's it's inherently a a an unstructured activity in many ways, it, it gets repurposed and redesigned for the whatever the opportunities are in the communities and in the regions that, that we were looking at. Peter, let me just push you a little bit further on this, the, the, the health of the bioscience sector. And, and are there sort of what I call good, interesting practices that you've observed where the local actor, the regional or the provincial actors have actually taken, taken charge um, I think in most cases where the biosciences are are delivering products that are are entering the commercial space, they are locally or regionally organized and, and managed. It doesn't matter whether it's the 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 activities around the, the Atlantic fish industry that that have have migrated into the supercluster in in Atlantic Canada or the, the the bioscience effort across the prairie regions that's largely differentially funded by uh, farmer checkoffs. But is is focused on bringing certain types of crops to the market. I think where they 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 blow past the program design that we've created is that most of our program design is it has a a limit to where it can be used and where it should look for motivation. So we tend to stop at provincial boundaries or national boundaries as governments, and yet the the industrially driven ones see the world as their oyster. So if I think of the work I work, I, I examine in the Prairie region, the, the bioscience work there is international. They, they, are, they have a, a, a piece of a larger uh, whole rather than a self-contained effort in Saskatoon or in Calgary or Edmonton or, or Winnipeg. David, let me turn back to you. You talked about levers of power and et cetera that, that the provinces have may or may not have used effectively. Um, how, is, how does that current division of powers and levers actually work for creating a culture of innovation across Canada? Well, um, I suppose that um, 
one way to answer your question is that we don't really have a culture of innovation <laughs> across Canada, Janet. Um, I think that, uh, I think that Peter Nicholson, the, the, uh, the, the founding president of the uh, Council of Canadian Academies, uh, once remarked that Canada innovates just enough and no more uh, than, than, than we need to. Uh, and I think that there is actually a, a perennial concern about whether or not this, this, uh, this is across the board in some sort of uniform sense, a, a, a country of, of, of innovators that share a, a, a kind of a common culture. Um, so let me unpack that uh, a, a little bit because I think that certainly, um, and this is sort of following on, on, on Peter's theme, Certainly the, uh, the programs, the initiatives, the funding, various kinds of supports that come out of ISED, for example, um, have definitely started to have a much more consolidated, coherent language around the way that innovation can be shaped uh, and uh, why it matters to Canada in terms of exports, being able to return wealth to the country so that we can have the social programs that we like. And so there's, there's actually a pretty coherent narrative that's been coming out of out of Ottawa for a number of, of, of years. But it's really how that is picked up and selectively used uh, in the provinces um, because the provinces are oftentimes very much driven uh, in their thinking about innovation, if they're thinking at all explicitly about it, which is a, another issue. Uh, but if they're thinking about it, they tend to pick it up in ways that are always very valenced by um, the political uh, forces that are shaping the, uh, shaping the economy. So let me give you an example just from, from um, British Columbia, because I think that one of the things that's happened in the past five to eight years, probably most clearly um, uh, started by the, the former BC Liberal uh, government, uh, is that they actually started to move uh, more and more in the direction of higher value add um, services in say financial tech or, or um, digital technologies uh, and really started to shift BC uh, even further away from uh, the 70, 80 year long legacy of this province of being quite focused on, on resources and services to support the resource sector. Um, now that's been picked up and used slightly differently by the NDP and their, uh, in their uh, approach. But nevertheless, the, the, uh, the, the selectivity that has gone on in picking particular sectors and giving uh, a fresh coat of paint to what people have been doing in those sectors uh, is something that we see happening very frequently with, with provincial governments. And so that's why when you then sort of multiply that across and look at all of the different, uh, what happens in the different provinces, uh, you see uh, very different conceptions of what innovation can and should be. So I've explained for what it is in the BC context, but it's radically different in the Alberta context with respect to two major uh, pushes around health and uh, around the energy sector. Um, Agrosciences in the, in the context of, of, um, of Saskatchewan, and then it just keeps on being different as you go across, across the country. That's why I think that the, um, the, there isn't a coherent culture. Um, there isn't even coherent language, and it's always shaped by the local forces. Peter, will you, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Maybe I can jump in there. There's, there. there's a metaphor we've been playing around with in, in what we've seen. It's a bit like going to a, a, a banquet. The, the federal government is in many ways the chef. They've, they've laid out a banquet table that, that they, they have plates at the end and people can construct their own meals. And everybody comes back with a different looking meal. Some people mound them up. Some people have have them all nicely designed. Some people start with the dessert and end up with the, the, the hors d'oeuvres at the, en the end. That's what we're seeing, is we're seeing a smorgasbord mentality across the space. People are taking and using and consuming the parts that are most attractive at the time. And the same person going through the smorgasbord line at different points in their, the day or in, in their lifetime will construct their plate differently. And, and to some extent, that's what we saw over the 20 or 30 years we examined in these provinces, a, a much more dynamic take up and use of, of policy and mechanisms than, than one would think from the book we wrote with, with Bruce about uh, the national system, which looked much more organized and, and thoughtful and, and iterative in many ways. 
I love that image of the federal government as chef. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, one of the big meals that they did put on the table um, a few years ago was super clusters. Um, so here is a mega meal, um, which has, I, and you use the words dynamic take up. Um, Talk, of course, this, this has had a lot of um, debate recently because of the Parliamentary Budget Officer report that came out um, being somewhat critical of this and its, its, its progress. Um, so let's, let's take this subnational lens, get you to talk a little bit about the supercluster initiative and, you know, the, the debates. There's a number of things that have been discussed around it. First, of course, is whether the funding was spread too thinly. That brings up that old chestnut of local versus distributed innovation systems. So how does that initiative resonate with your assessment of this diverse structure across Canada? And I'll turn to you, David, to start off sure. on that. Sure. Yeah, super clusters are, um, they're a pretty interesting program because you know they are um, they are a, uh, another instantiation of a of a program or initiative by the federal government to try to deal with innovation performance and business competitiveness. And we've seen other uh, thematic um, approaches to this in the past. You know, for a while um, uh, there was a very strong push to see that universities became. Um, better commercializers of, of research. So the single point failure at that point in time was thought to be the post-secondary education institutions um, um, perceived lack of involvement in commercialization activities. And that, that thematic sort of waned for a little while. Um, and then for uh, a period, it was all about strengthening the Canadian um, intellectual property system. Um, and so people took uh, pokes at that to see whether or not that was actually the single point of failure in our our innovation and business competitiveness. Um, and now, um, you know, the, the, about three and a half, four years ago, the, the, the new thematic that arose uh, was solid evidence that as, um, uh, you know, a, a wealthy country, we still had very low business expenditure on research and development, the so-called bird scores. Um, and while that is true, um, there's a question that sort of is in the background as well. How important is bird to innovation and business to competitiveness? So we can talk about that, but nevertheless, that's, that's the thematic that then gave rise to the, to the super clusters. And the super clusters are really interesting because there may actually be a sense in which um, they have at their heart sort of a, a, a paradox that it might actually be an oxymoron that you can't both cluster and then have it, um, arranged in a way which uh, uh, transcends the geography of clustering. So it, there's, and so the, the reason why I bring that up, Janet, is that uh, it always has struck me that um, the question about whether or not there was enough investment um, is an interesting question. If you put that as the, the number as the numerator, but then look at the regional distribution as, as, the, as the denominator, and it's, and it's no surprise that we have five and they're kind of nicely geographically distributed across the, across the country, which, um, as I say, it, it raises the question about, uh, about whether or not ocean research undertaken in the Atlantic side has any bearing or meaning on the Pacific side. It has questions, you know, raises questions about whether or not uh, what's happening in in the Quebec and Ontario superclusters has relevance um, to to the BC um, digital supercluster, and and so on and so forth. So that's that's my kind of entree in, into the subject. And you were mentioning the 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 recent flack that the uh, uh, superclusters were getting from the parliamentary uh, 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 business officer. Um, and I think that, that that's actually really um, a, a, an interesting report to read um, because I think that it's, it's quite critical of the timelines that um, uh, took to stand up the super clusters and to get funding contribution agreements and projects uh, underway. And I, I think that there's a respect in which that, that's true and it's what everybody knows and what everybody knew going into the super clusters that these were not going to be just add water and stir type activities. These were these are actually quite complex uh, initiatives to, to set up. 
So there, there was that, that comment. But I think the more interesting um, dimension of the PBO report on this was that um, the, the, that the, uh, the, the budget officer actually put um, the, the finger on I said to make sure that they actually had good, reliable, consistent metrics to understand whether or not the investment that had been made in the super clusters was in fact producing the results of, that were desired of the, of the program. And um, I think that the most interesting remark in, in the PBO report uh, is one that says that um, I said was not really forthcoming with uh, a coherent set of, of metrics that they would be using uh, by which to evaluate the super clusters. So that I think is something that we need to keep our eye on because yes, it's a big expenditure uh, but we also, I think, need to see some progress on, on the question of innovation performance in, in the country. And if we discover that um, um, bird expenditures are really not the, you know, the, the magic bullet for unleashing innovation and business competitiveness in this country, we better be able to demonstrate that. Or if it is, then we better be able to demonstrate that it has a positive effect as well. Well, the... Uh, I've always considered bird was a symptom, not a, not the cause. Uh, but uh, Peter, I want to turn to you because this question of what is the clarity of our expectations and how do we actually measure them? These are issues you've thought about, and I'm interested in your own thoughts as to were there clear expectations? How would you actually try to assess the outcomes the impacts of this investment. Let me make two observations. And one's a, the first one's a bridging observation. Our work that we're, we're talking about today largely is based on where the province fits in the national ecosystem of innovation. Interestingly, provinces are, are relatively disenfranchised in much of the supercluster process. Mm -hmm. Their money was not counted for matching. In some three, only three of the five match with a province. So the other two are trying to, to organize it across multiple provinces. And then of course their, their mandates stretch sectorally way beyond wherever they're located. And so there's a, there's a, 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 a scaling issue that completely disconnects the super clusters from much of what is the, 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 the albeit somewhat weak architecture of innovation in Canada because the provinces do control many of the levers. So that's a, that's a, a basic one. But the second problem is that a lot of these programs are designed completely ignoring everything we know about the impacts of innovation. You know, we know gestating innovation, unless you're doing an app and you, you know, that might be days or weeks to get to the market. Most things that, that, that the federal government is actually incentivizing, we talk in years, if not decades, between the time somebody has a Eureka to the, t to the first user who can take it up and use it for its intended purpose. Often not the one that the inventor thought it would be used for. We also know that in some of these sectors, most of the science sectors that the federal government is particularly excited about, the peak benefit is 23 to 25 years later and usually is distributed well beyond any geographic uh, boundary that, that, that programs design. And so we've, we've created a, 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 a challenge that these things are supposed to be delivering something within five years, getting up from zero to investing a billion dollars or 900 and some million dollars of federal uh, largesse plus an, some multiple of that of, of public and other private funds. And then they want, uh, they want jobs, they want exports, they want, they want all these, these desirable downstream things, which have nothing to do with many of the investments they're doing. The, the, the other problem they have that, that sort of disconnects these from, from the more formalized part of the agenda is that while they, the, the mantra in the early years of the, the super clusters, this is about increasing bird. When you look at many of the investments, they were about using the results of bird, not about trying to encourage the, the increase of business, biz, business directed investment in R&D. It's about getting downstream and creating jobs and income from, from a, a product or a service that's a result of some pre-existing bird. And that's the reality. Th these things are, are you know maybe over 15 years we might have a better better handle on them but so that there's the 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 constitutional or, or architectural challenge of of how they've designed it and and I'm on record in a number of categories as saying that 
they they also are telling are are, are designed to tell just so stories. Uh, they 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 have little or no counterfactuals that they're they're testing on. They're 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 doing things. They're spending. They're allocating resources. They're going to be able to show capital and and labor requirements in those, and they'll show certain firms succeed and 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 enter the commercial space with products or services that are new. That that's fine. But how do we know that's any better than the previous uses for that nine hundred million dollars, which were you know it wasn't new money. It was money taken out of other federal programming. So there's there there's this this fundamental question that we've never grappled with in this country, of of measuring what we do in a way that we know it's delivering anything more than than just as Keynes used to say, burying the money or dropping it from the top of a building and hoping people go out and spend it, and and our evidence is very weak. Uh, we we tell stories that are are more about about you know personalized stories of success rather than than systemic. Uh, evidence of performance. Yeah, no kidding. And you know, Peter, you said two things there that that I I have a couple of follow on thoughts. You know, your first your first remark where you pointed out the massive heterogeneity between the between the five, both in terms of how they're structured, how they're spread out over geographies, and the intent of them. Uh, actually, from a program evaluation point of view, provide, generates, I think, an insurmountable challenge because you can't make comparative assessments within the program to see how the five performed. And so that goes to the, these are all going to be one-offs and you'll get just those uh, stories. The other thing that I, I, I find interesting about this um, business expenditure in R&D is that when you look at our, uh, this I think is just a follow on to your second point about what are we measuring things? Um, one thing that we do measure uh, is the the mix of small, uh, medium, and large enterprises in this country, and we would have known well in advance uh, of the supercluster program um, what the capacity is to actually spend on R and D, uh, given that the vast majority of the of the companies that exist in this country are actually really rather small. Um, now. Uh, that to me, I find interesting from the standpoint of, of uh, you know, there's got to be some kind of a proportionality there for the size of the program relative to what um, firms can actually spend on R&D. And it'll have to come out in the wash in a couple of years, uh, whether or not the, the firms that are engaged in, in the program actually do have the wherewithal to, to spend, uh, to spend on, on R&D. And my suspicion is, is that that the, the few, the bigs that are all already engaged in the, uh, in, in the program uh, will uh, take advantage of the program and partnering and working with other, uh, other companies. But in a sense, they'll be doing what they would have done anyway. So the real question is, is it going to actually have any measurable impact on firm scaling and the profitability and, and resilience of, of the handful of medium-sized firms in each of the five sectors that are, are being supported by the program. And is that something that the provinces themselves, the provinces and territories can influence through their own policies and levers? Is that something that your book will touch, touch on? Peter, you want to go with that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, an excellent question. At, at the moment, I think they're, they're, as with many federal programs, more than happy to tag along, motivate, redirect, use for their particular unique purposes, whatever comes out of the super clusters. But they, they have the luxury with this program compared to a lot of programs where they're, they're, they're constitutionally or, or architecturally disenfranchised from being responsible for the outcome so that that you know that because the, they can't be on boards for most of them they, they're not formal funders for most of them they're 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 external partners not internal partners and that 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 does give a license to to be more um i was going to say rapacious but more opportunistic about using federal resources for for local and regional interests um, and, and that isn't necessarily a positive thing because it does mean that, that they, they may not see these as strategic parts of their long-term future because they are nominally five-year five year investment blocks. And at the end of the five years, something is dumped, is, is, is left as a rump. And, and it's not clear who will be responsible and how that will be uh, for the, 
the, the residual assets and, and operations. I mean, I think there was a hope that they might be self-sufficient, but um, that that's that's true of most federal programs that are structured like this, and very few of them actually become truly self-sufficient in terms of generating their own cash flow to operate. They still require somebody to carry the overhead and some of the, the losses because this is not a heavy profit center area. I think, you know, there's a really nice example here in British Columbia where the you know, the province, I think, has actually taken a pretty active interest in the in the digital super cluster. Um, certainly did a lot of this, the staging and getting people organized and providing some of the background supports to it. But, you know, as you say, you know, once these things get get launched, they tend to have the sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of an, an autonomy and a lifespan of, of their own. Uh, but, you know, the, the at the same time, you know, if the super cluster is the tree, the, you know, the that they can hang little baubles on it. Um, and uh, certainly investments in, uh, in quantum computing, for example, is something then that the, that the provincial government can add to the mix on their, on their own. So they can start to align other things. But the other thing that they've done, which at least before um, COVID uh, uh, messed with everybody's existence, uh, they were actually using the super cluster, the digital super cluster here as a really strong calling card uh, to, to build up the innovation uh, transborder with uh, Washington State, Oregon, and California uh, to strengthen those relationships. Now, those, those, uh, the Cascadia concept is, goes beyond digital technologies, but they were definitely using that as a very strong calling card to interact with, you know, Microsoft, for example, uh, and and other firms. So, um, I I think you're absolutely right that the the uh, the provinces don't always necessarily appear to be all in in some of these initiatives, but once those initiatives are launched, boy, do they ever make good use of them yeah. to, to do other things that they perceive as being within their mandate. And David, you used the word COVID, and of course, no discussion. You, can ha you can't have any discussion uh, these days without talking about the pandemic. And obviously our response to the pandemic has highlighted the, the role of innovation in approaching, managing, mitigating the crisis. So why don't you take a bit of a subnational lens on this and uh, talk about what we're, we're learning from um, the Canadian approach to COVID that relates to innovation and obviously uh, the relative role of governments, plural. Mm -hmm. Let me just say two, two things about it. I know that Peter has lots to add on, on this topic as well. So um, I, uh, I've been moderating a, uh, one of the channels in the uh, Chief uh, Science Officer's uh, initiative, Can COVID, and it was a data sharing, uh, a data sharing channel. And what's very interesting is, is that um, researchers across this country are doing an exceptional job of being able to share information back and forth about uh, about some of the you know the, some of the basic science around the virology, the epidemiology of it, um, the the sanitation uh, issues uh, associated with it, and so they're doing an amazing job of of doing this within just a very short amount of time. The Can COVID initiative had over three thousand people signed up to it, mostly university uh, based researchers. So, from the standpoint of people get, getting on top of the problem, it, it was pretty remarkable, right up until the point. When you talk about trying to actually share health data across this country, uh, we are we are a country uh, with brick walls um, between us in terms of the sharing of health data. So, one of the things that everybody has found absolutely exasperating uh, is the fact that um, uh, patient case reports, for example, have to be incredibly sanitized. Takes a lot of time um, to be able to have interprovincial discussions ab uh, about them. Um, and it's been actually uh, quite quite problematic for the country as a whole to be able to report our national data out uh, to organizations like the OECD and the WHO uh, because of the discontinuities between our provinces and territories and the way that we collect this kind of information. So we've we've got a big, big, big data uh, challenge associated with uh, with with health. Um, the second thing I'll, I'll mention about this though was uh, what, uh, you know when the pandemic was was really hitting um, just you know towards the end of March and, and getting much worse through April and May. Uh, and there was a, there were there were two pressures for uh, 
uh, goods to uh, show up in the health system, um, PPE and ventilators. It was remarkable, in my opinion, the extent to which um, uh, innovators across this country would take things like uh, 3D printing de devices uh, and within a very short amount of time, figure out how to make um, uh, face shields uh, 3D printable and then share that information on the internet. And you know, some of our, our physicists, and I think even our Nobel laureate, Art McDonald was involved in a ventilator initiative that uh, was part, uh, partly supported by Triumph to, to basically rebuild ventilators better and cheaper. Uh, fantastic. And it really got me wondering, and I think this loops back to your question about culture in some way, Janet, uh, at the beginning of our discussion here, which is why is it that, a, 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 or how is it maybe is the better question because the why is fairly obvious, I suppose, but how is it that uh, a pandemic can unleash such a flood of tremendous innovative activity so quickly unlike any other government program. And so this is a really, this is a really, it's an interesting question to, 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 to study the dynamics of innovation and innovative behavior, which I think is going to make some pretty fantastic PhD theses, uh, um, you know, in, in years to come, because it really did, uh, it did expose a capability of, of, of standing up uh, some pretty remarkable initiatives very quickly and really showed how, uh, how you know, that we're sitting on a huge amount of ingenuity in the, in the country, um, but it needed some kind of unlocking mechanism and this happened to be one, unfortunately one, yeah. Peter, and you're still muted. I'm yeah. back. So comments, reactions, reflections on innovation. Yeah, let me key off a point David made. He, he said, we've, we've seen a, a, a fascinating bottom-up, uh, almost organic response to a threat as, as people turn their programming different ways. And that's, that's all across the space. That's the first, I always say, say that's the first test to know whether you've got at least a, a candidate for an innovation space. The second one is, as we move from the threat stage to the opportunity stage, do we sustain that or do we revert back, snap back to our, our world of zero sum, you know, it's, 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 it's all mine or I'm not playing kind of mentality that we've had. We, we clearly have not overcome some of the hurdles in terms of data, but in, in terms of people who are not restricted by those data, we, we're finding sure. interesting relationships that may not be there. So I think that's, a, that's something I think the federal government needs to think about as they shift their agenda from you know, uh, response to recovery, because the, it's starting to sound like they're going to have a post COVID agenda that that once again is, is well structured and is it is designed in the image of a national system that's purposefully directed towards something. And yet, what we've shown is that there are a whole bunch of interconnections that nobody knew existed, a whole bunch of a, a, a lot of capacity to respond and engage in ways that 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 we would not have anticipated but for the presence of this threat. So I think it, you, know, you can see that at, at the university level, you can see that at the hospital level, you can see that in terms of even federal labs, that in some cases, you know, probably in the eyes of, of some of our colleagues in Ottawa, went rogue because instead of waiting for Ottawa to tell them what to do, they went out and found their local partners and, and engaged in something that was contributing to the national agenda. Uh, I see that in some of the, the project space I'm in, where people who were working on one problem just shifted right over and started to use their tools not to not to address the immediate needs, but to move towards the longer term solution around around COVID and its infection infectious nature. So I, I I think there's a bottom up story that here that 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 if it's not heard in Ottawa, there will be a risk that we will once again wait, miss an opportunity of bringing more resources to bear on what, what we want in terms of a national agenda, because people will say, well, it's just same old, same old, you know, somebody in Ottawa is telling me what I should do ret rather than what I need to do or want to do or think is, is most valuable in my area of space. And that's academics are in that space. Firms are equally in that space. Quite often there's, they comment that, that, you know, in a post COVID world, it won't all be about vaccines, you know, but I, I fear that that will be, you know, we, we get a, a, a tunnel vision when we see a problem. And yet it, it has told us about a whole bunch of different ways we can organize our economy and society. 
And if we ignore that and focus on the immediate, the need that we should have had or could would have liked to have had years ago, you know, a year ago, we'll, we'll miss an opportunity to actually take advantage of the, some of the new ways that we work, some of the new ways we, we operate. The, the whole virtual space we've, we're doing now and, and that most of us now live in has particular value for most of our industries if we can convert it to you know, sort of normal usage. And there's a fear that we may just snap back to the way we were before. And as we sort of move towards wrapping this up, we're talking of moving from response to recovery. Any reflections on how we can trigger or continue this? Um, and of course, what Peter, you were talking about is it's not the heavy hand of government. It's much more this, this bottom up creativity, ingenuity, capacity and marshalling that. So how do we move um, and particularly using the provincial, the subnational lens uh, towards recovery. Any insights, any reflections on things that we should be pursuing, thinking about? Well, I think just to just to follow on what what Peter was saying. I mean, I, I think in this case, it's 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 already time to start really actually having some some really good thought experiments and play out some scenarios because. Um, I think everybody would prefer the world in which um, there's a, um, you know, a, a, a safe, affordable, easy to produce vaccine that just takes COVID off of the table entirely. Um, naturally, everybody would prefer that. Um, but what, what if it actually just becomes endemic mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, it persists with us? So if we, ha if we started off by thinking, well, what if it is just endemic, then what would we actually do differently to actually sustain our economy uh, while being, uh, you know, providing all of the supports, making sure we've got all of the determinants of innovation there, uh, so that we can actually that we can actually thrive? I think that's the that's the kind of question we need to be to be asking. Now, if you put that back into the context in which Peter and I've been researching around the. Um, uh, the subnational science, technology, and innovation policy landscape of the of the country is that it would it's going to take some I think significant effort um, to make sure that uh, elected officials in particular um, are singing from the the same song sheet about some of this. I suspect that there's much better coordination amongst unelected officials working inter, you know, across the provinces with the federal government than we see uh, um, the elected officials. But I think it's going to take something like, uh, you know, putting, putting, down the, uh, putting down the really strong sort of campaign type rhetoric uh, uh, around, you know, provincial, uh, provincial solidarity and, um, you, know, uh, you know, making scoring points uh, in the political landscape by contrasting uh, what one would do or not do well relative to the federal government. I think that that's, we need to sort of tone down that aspect of our confederation and maybe tune up the part of our confederation that's actually about uh, having a, a multi, multiple layers of government that are actually meant to give devolved authority and, and uh, powers where appropriate, but that we can actually use that confederation to actually move the country as a whole in directions that are going to help us think about, well, what would it look like if COVID were endemic? How is that going to affect our post-secondaries, our health system? Um, how are we going to treat um, uh, insecurities for people with respect to labor uh, and so on and so forth? So I think that that's really what it's going, going to take because right now, uh, I think that COVID as a stress test has shown us that some of our cherished Canadian um, institutions are actually a little bit more fragile than we thought that they were. Peter, the last word to you on this. Yeah, going back to our book, one of the things that, that quite surprised us is that, that we had anticipated with 10 provinces and three territories and a 30-year period that we would find a, a load of natural experiments where we could pick and choose and we'd see learning going on between provinces. It's like we're talking about 13 different countries that, that, that are... are are in the middle of an ocean and because most of the idea flow seems to be offshore to Canada. So there's, there's something missing at that meso level. 
we're, we're, our innovation systems are functioning locally. The federal government seems to be well organized. The provinces are, are engaged, they're active, but they're, they're not working as an order of government, they're working as governments. And I think there's a, there's a challenge there. And I'm not sure we've ever had a, a halcyon period where, where they all, where we had provinces working together, but we've, many of our federal structures actually encourage competition rather than encourage coming together. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think that's going to be one of the things that I take that as a COVID lesson, because when I don't see boundaries, when I see activities of people who are engaged in responding to COVID. I see boundaries that were pre-existing, but the groups that, that emerged in this actually just went to where it made sense. And that's, you know, that's a, a lesson we could learn in this policy space is that too often we want to control rather than, than enable the creative and innovative activities of individuals and firms and, and organizations. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. We could go on for hours. Um, I think my recommendation is that you're going to have to write another book in 10 years and another <laughs> one again in, in 20. Um, but my last question is a very simple one. When is your current book, your new book, going to be going out, coming out in print? should be in the first quarter of 2021, I think. That's our goal. Excellent. So our audience will, I'm sure, be looking for that. But let me just thank you, David Castle, Peter Phillips, for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Janet. Wonderful.